Lord, we trust you, and we're learning from you, and we're excited about all that you're doing in our lives. I pray that you would guide and direct our thoughts today. This is our great opportunity to worship you and to celebrate you, and we want to take it. Thank you for all that you do. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. You can be seated as our ushers join us up front. Today is Mother's Day, and we'll talk more about that uh, later, but one of the things that we learn from motherhood is the beauty of giving. And in many of our lives, probably even most of our lives, one of the most generous people that we've been around was the mother figure, our mom or maybe the mother of our children. And we get to see them being generous with the way that they spend their time and the way that they kind of organize their life around those who need them. And so let's be generous the way God has shown us generosity through the mothers in our lives. Um, Lord, thank you for this gift. Thank you for the opportunity to give it back to you. May it be blessed in your name. Amen. You were the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation. Thank you. 
the throne of God I have a strong and perfect plea a great high priest whose name is Lord whoever lives and pleads for me my name is great We trust you with all that you're doing in our lives. We trust you with this beautiful moment. We realize your presence is here, and we ask, Lord, that you would help us to hear from you today. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Great job, you guys. Great job. So good to have you guys with us on this Mother's Day. 
I know that for many, this is an extremely happy and exciting day uh, throughout the year, one of, one of our favorite holidays. Before I dive into the text, I'd like to talk to you just a bit about Mother's Day, if I could. I know that uh, for many of you, today is a day of celebration, uh, and you get to be with your mom, or you get to, uh, if you're a mom, you get to be with your kids, and so you're kind of celebrating the whole experience of motherhood, and, and for that, we're very thankful. I, I, for one, come from a situation where I was raised by uh, a mom and a dad, but a mom to talk about today, uh, who is very nurturing and kind and caring and loving, and, and even on today, we're celebrating with a meal that instead of letting us cook it, she made sure that it's taken care of, and we tried, and she's like, no, I've got this, and, and, and then in the long run, I think two other moms who didn't have families to go hang out with today are coming to our, you know, coming to our Mother's Day party, and it's just a, a great thing to, to have that opportunity. Um, I'm married to a great mom. I'm very thankful for Stephanie and the way that she balances me out as a parent, because although I think I'm a decent dad, I would be a horrible mother. You know what I mean? Scrape on the knee, you wuss, quit crying, get up and get back on with it, put some dirt on it, that kind of thing. Um, Stephanie is so nurturing and kind and caring to our two boys, and, and uh, without her, we would be in big trouble and they would need therapy. And so, uh, that's just the honest truth. And, and, uh, and, and my mother-in-law, who is Stephanie's mom, has been like a second mother to me since we started dating at 14, and uh, just a major impact. In fact, Stephanie's grandmother, who's uh, who is Granny Jean to us and has been a bit of a grandmother to me in many ways. So very thankful for all those things. So uh, I know that many of you experience similar things to what I'm talking about on this day. Now, at the same time, we also must be honest and, and real and talk about the fact that for many, Mother's Day is not that type of experience. Uh, it may be that you're with us today and your mother has passed away, or for some other reason, you're not able to be with her. Maybe there's some sort of relational disconnect going on. And for, for you, today is a bit melancholy. It's a bit, you know, not, un, not sure how to feel. And still there are others I know who would love to be a mom, have the experience of motherhood, and for whatever reason that has escaped them to this point, or it hasn't happened yet, or you may be to a place in life where you've come to grips with the reality that that might not happen in your life. And so for many, Mother's Day can be a painful day, a, a a sad day. And so we come today as a group of people, a church here at Community, recognizing that many people are experiencing many different things, and we want to celebrate with those who are celebrating, and we want to mourn with those who are mourning, and we want to hope with those who are hopeful of what happens next, okay? So this is why we typically don't do the oldest mother, youngest mother, stand up and give out the gift and all the different things, is that although we want to add to the celebration of motherhood, we don't want to add to the challenge or the agony that some might be facing and make it a very difficult day. I, I have in the past pastored young ladies who literally could not come to church on Mother's Day. They just couldn't deal with all of the things that go along with that. And so uh, we kind of recognize that people are in various different places. So having said all of that, uh, in this room, we do want to celebrate the moms who have in, invested in children and husbands and families and, and various different people, those who literally were investing in their own biological children, those who have adopted, cared for, taken care of, and fostered children that God gave them through other ways, and those who've simply been great mother figures uh, to the people in their life who needed them. Would you guys just join with me in a hand celebration for moms, and we thank you guys. A absolutely, absolutely. So we are in a teaching series, the second week, called The Tightrope. And the whole idea of this series is to look at how legalism and lawlessness form two extremes that we as Christians don't want to fall into. We don't want to fall into a more Jewish understanding of the scriptures that make it seem as if God is just a God of rules and we have to simply follow those rules in order to stay in contact with him or connection to him and ultimately thinking that we earn something from God by behaving a certain way. That would be legalism. That would be wrong. Lawlessness would be just the opposite. One who would claim that grace gives us freedom to behave any way in every way that we want and that there are no guidelines, direction, principles from Scripture that could help us make wise choices. And somewhere in the middle of those two is the tightrope, that which we walk in between those extremes. And we're using Sabbath, specifically 
what it means to experience Sabbath rest as kind of our um, specific detail that we're talking about in understanding this role of legalism and lawlessness in our life and how we're going to live life in between those two extremes. So we read last week, I'll just kind of give you a few things that we already learned, but we read last week the fourth commandment of the Ten Commandments from Exodus chapter 20. It says this, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. If you'll remember, the, the word remember specifically deals with taking something from the past and making sure that it's living in the present and that it will live on in the future. That's ultimately what's going there. The scripture says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. That means special, separate, unique, different. Six days you will labor and do all your work. But on the seventh day, that's the Sabbath day to the Lord your God. And on that day, you shall not do any work, not you or son or daughter or servants or those living in your house, not even your livestock. Nobody's working on that day. Everybody's resting. Uh, verse, uh, I think it is 10 or 11 says, For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea, all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. And therefore the Lord has blessed this Sabbath, which ultimately means rest, okay, this rest day, and he made it special. He made it different. He made it holy. Okay, so we learned this reality from last week. We're going to keep doing that. We also remember that the audience who first heard of Sabbath were former slaves who had been worked to the grindstone seven days a week, and they would have automatically recognized a day of rest as a blessing and not as some sort of religious obligation. They would have seen it as, oh my gosh, how amazing is this God who makes sure that my family still eats even though I don't work one day a week. I can choose to rest and to celebrate that without fear of having nothing in the long run. We also talked about the two extreme idols in this passage, how some make an idol of work. I know you may have experienced this before I have, where we get to a place where we value our job and what we do so much that we allow ourselves to work too much, we give it too much attention, we allow too much of our identity to be wrapped up in what we, ha what we do. Some have experienced that during moments where they were not employed and they felt maybe worse about themselves than they should have because as a person they were, they were taking too much pride in their work and not having work and it meant that they had no self-strength or struggle. And so in the long run, that taught them that reality. Sometimes we can make work into an idol. But other times our culture makes comfort into an idol. In other words, we spend too much time in the recliner, you know, too much time playing video games, too much time doing nothing productive. And in the long run, we might end up without what we need because of the fact that we've celebrated comfort more than we should. In the fourth commandment about Sabbath, what we learn is that God wants you to work. He wants you to give. He wants you to struggle. He wants you to move forward, be productive. But then he also wants you to rest and experience the joys that come with rest in that seventh day kind of way of thinking. So you guys got that? I want to make sure we get that in our background. We walked through questions like, should we be celebrating Sabbath on Sunday or Saturday? And ultimately, we really looked at the question of, is the Sabbath day kind of binding for Christians? And the, the reality there is that in the New Testament, uh, it's less about a day and more about other things. So it's less about this focus specifically on rest, and it's more about gathering together, worshiping, and even serving one another, caring for people, taking care of one another. These are the ways that Jesus celebrated the Sabbath, okay? So these are the things we're learning. A couple of scripture verses that we picked up last week, Romans 14 says, one person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days the same, okay? Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind, and even the one who observes the one day observes it in honor of the Lord. So there are some who are going to say, the Sabbath is Saturday, okay, that's cool. The others, Sabbath is Sunday, okay, that's great too. Well, I, I, my day off, my opportunity is Tuesday, okay, rest. Because in the long run, what we're learning is as Christians deal with Old Testament law, we're realizing that Jesus has already completed. He's already fulfilled all of the things required of us. Jesus says in Matthew 5, I have not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. So all of those things that people in the Old Testament were trying to earn by accomplishing the task given by the law, Jesus earns all of those things for us. And he even says in Romans 10, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who trusts in him or believes in him, okay? So he fulfills that for us. 
We don't have to do the law in order to perform well for God. Christ has done that performance for us on our behalf, and we get to follow him and trust him in the process. He even went so far as to say, come to me, all of you who are burdened heavily and weary and tired. And he said, I will give you what? Rest. That's the same word for Sabbath. I'll give you rest. And so what we learn there is this. It's kind of the first point for today. It's the big deal is we as New Testament Christians, we don't necessarily rest on a specific day. We find rest in Christ. There's a bit of a different way of thinking there. We find rest in Christ. I know you've done this. You ever been around someone who was going through something so traumatic and you would anticipate that they would be flipping out, scared to death, worried beyond comprehension, but somehow through the midst of this job they've lost, this relationship that's over, this illness that they're facing, somehow they seem settled. They seem secure. They seem strong. And you're wondering, how in the world does a person have that ability to handle this horrible moment with that level of rest? The truth is, it's not that it's Sunday, so they're resting, you know, or it's Saturday, so they're resting. No, it's not about what day of the week it is. It's about the fact that this person has found rest in Christ. This is a beautiful thing for us, folks. You see, we don't have to think like people who are outside of God's rest six days a week, and we're toiling and worrying and running and doing all these things that are so challenging and difficult, and then, hey, one day a week we get to rest. That's not really the way we have to think. We realize that the New Testament teaches us that when a person becomes a follower of Jesus, that the Holy Spirit, also known as the Comforter, rests in them and fills them from within, so whatever they face, they have the comforter. Wherever they go, they have the comforter. Whatever they're dealing with, the Holy Spirit is there in and around and through them so that they don't just get to rest on a day, but they get to rest in Christ, wherever you are, whatever you're facing, whatever day it is. You and I have the opportunity to rest in Christ. And I'm afraid for many New Testament Christian believers We don't live this out in a practical way so that we still experience overwhelming amounts of anxiety. We still worry. We we still struggle. We still find ourselves overly busy, drawn out, stretched, pushed too far, or just the opposite. We don't understand the importance of productivity and working, and we rest too much, and we worry about getting too stressed, and in the long run, we find ourselves not all that productive. In the long run, we have to realize this. As Christians, Christ is in us, and we are in Christ. And no matter what we face, we can rest in him. We can rest in him. In the midst of a long work day, you can rest in him. In the midst of an extremely challenging moment, you can rest in him. In the midst of a great um, stress upheaval, you can rest in him. This is why the Bible tells us that God gives us a peace that goes far beyond our understanding of what peace can do. And all of a sudden, we see ourselves or maybe those around us handling things simply much better than you would expect us to be able to handle it. So the first step in understanding how this works is to realize that rest or the Sabbath was made for us, not the other way around. We were not made For the Sabbath. And ultimately, that shows us that the Sabbath is a gift from God. So let me read this to you. You were not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for you. Jesus actually is the one who teaches us this. He says in Scripture that in Mark Mark 2 27, he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Let me give you a little background here. In the Jewish world, they had begun to recognize or think, kind of live as if, that, that Sabbath was just an obligation. It's something you have to do because God said so, and if you break that rule, you're causing loads of trouble, you're offending God, and you're, you're ultimately digging your own hole, okay? You're, you're, you're creating a pit of problems for yourself if you break the Sabbath. And so they came up with a thousand rules of all these little things that would help keep you one step away from the Sabbath. You know what I mean, don't you? Like rules that try to keep you from breaking other rules? I'll give you an example. 
when I was in college, I went to a a uh, pretty conservative Baptist, Christian Baptist college. And in many ways, it was designed to raise up pastors, ministry leaders, and different things. And, and so, for instance, there were morality rules about boys and girls in their own dorm rooms. Okay? There, you can imagine some of those morality rules. But what was funny was all of the rules that got made on top of the rules, and then there were other rules on top of that to try to ultimately help you make sure that you didn't break the ultimate rule. Right? So there were like time limits. Okay? So like Boys can be in this part of the area, but not that part of the area. And boys can be here, but not there. And, and, and you, you can only be there till 8 o'clock, like, because only bad things happen after 8 o'clock at night. You know, like, 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 she can't be there after 8. And then there were other rules, like, well, okay, there was one day a month when boys can go into girls' dorms, but they have to leave the door open. The door has to be open at all times. And then, then there are other rules, like, okay, well, on those days, nobody can wear shorts. Everybody has to wear pants. And, like, I'm, I'm making that one up. But, I mean, like, there's just... They're just weird. Like all of a sudden you had all kinds of little rules that were meant to reinforce the big rule, right? And so in the long run, it was kind of funny. Like, okay, we're going to install cameras in everybody's bedrooms. They didn't do that. But I mean, that's the kind of thing that it felt like where it was going on is all these different rules to enforce other rules. And that's what happened in the Jewish world is God said, hey, rest on the seventh day. That's, that's, that's your guideline. That's your direction. That's your commandment. And so they started creating hundreds of other, like, okay, well, you can take nine steps, but you can't take 10 steps. Take 10 steps, you're not resting. Nine steps is very restful. See what I mean? Like all of a sudden there became all of these things. And Jesus never broke the, the big Sabbath guideline, but he broke all these other little rules pretty often. Like he sees somebody that needs healing and he could, and he could heal them. So he heals them and people get mad at him. And like, well, you're working on the Sabbath. Why would you do that? Okay. Or people are hungry. They're starving. And he, and he gives them some food and says, here, eat. And others are going, what are you doing? Like, man, you're running a restaurant on the Sabbath. You can't, you can't do that. Like, you can't be working on the Sabbath. And so that's when Jesus says, you don't get this, okay? Rest was made for men and women, not men and women made for rest. In other words, this isn't some sort of God-created holy day that should be seen as an obligation for all human beings, and God made human beings with the anticipation that the obligation will be met. It's not that at all. It's that God made human beings, and he loves them with all of his heart. And so in the process of creating and loving them, he creates a gift for them. And the gift is rest, the opportunity to rest. First thing I hope we walk away today with is the understanding that Sabbath is a gift from God to you. It's a gift. It's a present. And in fact, it's, it's more than just a gift. It's a good gift. Let's talk about what we mean. Um, all over the world in various different religions, there are days of obligation celebrated. Okay, So in, in Hindu, um, in, in, in worship of various different things, uh, in, in the Muslim faith, various different things. And one of the things that most all world religions have are, are, are holy days of obligation. So the idea is this. The idea in, in world religions is that there's a day, like say Ramadan or, or other certain days, and on this day in the Catholic Church, the day of ascension, for instance, one, uh, like if you're, if you're a true believer, then you have to follow the rules of this day, and you have an obligation to follow through these specific details because God like, m is making you. Like, <laughs> like you have to, okay? God's upset with you if you don't. God's offended if you, if you in some way mess up this obligation, Okay? And for that reason, many people in the New Testament Christian church have thought of Sabbath as a day of obligation. Like, uh, like uh, you have to do this. You have, like, God's going to get on to you. God's going to smack you down, strike you with a lightning bolt if you don't do this thing that he told you that you have to do on the Sabbath. And in the long run, it's caused so many people to be pushed away from the warmth that exists between God and men and women in the gift that is Sabbath. You see, this isn't the kind of gift that creates obligation. This is the kind of gift that creates opportunity. So just for fun, let's talk for a second. How many of you have ever been given a gift that created obligation? Oh, you know what I mean. Here's what, I, here's what I'm talking about. That thing that you only bring out and set on the coffee table when that other person's coming over? Because they gave it to you and you hate it and it's ugly as can be, but you can't dare let them know that you don't have it and use it. And so you, you keep it in a certain spot and then you say, hey, you know, Aunt, Aunt Joyce is coming over tomorrow and like, oh my gosh, you got to sit out the gravy bowl. You know, like you haven't had gravy in years. Doesn't even matter. 
Like, you got to sit out the gravy bowl because Aunt Joyce gave it to you, and she's going to look for it. You know, she's going to notice whether or not it's out there, right? That's a gift. That's like me going to my wife and saying, hey, baby, happy Mother's Day. I got you a new set of dish rags. Boy, that's crickets right there. I mean, like, they were nice dish rags. Like, they were good ones. No, of course, like, it's not a good gift, right? It's not a good gift. It's like, hey, honey, Father's Day is coming up. I'm getting you a new push mower. Well, thanks. You know, like, I don't know what to say about that. I appreciate that. You know, like, here's what I'm getting at. Like, we're not talking about a God who's giving you a gift that's simply a, an obligation. Well, here's a gift, and now you have to follow it the rest of your life, or I'm mad at you, okay? Like an ugly Father's Day tie. You guys know what I mean? Like, I don't ever wear a tie. You get an ugly Father's Day tie, now you feel like you're going to wear it, Right? We try our best not to have gifts that bring about obligation. That, that, that in and of itself uh, makes it kind of not a gift, right? Or at least not a good gift. Uh, good gifts don't bring obligation. Good gifts bring opportunity. Like now you get to do this. You get to use this. You get to enjoy this. That's, that's more the perspective that we ought to have around Sabbath is that, is that this is a gift, not an obligation. This is a gift, not a requirement. This is a gift, not just in and of itself a responsibility. Because in our world, oftentimes what happens is if you, if you turn rest into an obligation, what you're really doing is you're turning rest into work. You're turning rest into work. Like, oh my gosh, I got to rest today. I better do it right. You see what I'm saying? Like, I, bet, I better, I got to rest well. I got to rest in a way that my supervisor is, it finds it acceptable. And I rested correctly, you know? But that's, that doesn't make any sense at all. That's what Jesus is saying. Is look, you don't understand. Men and women were not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for men and women. It's a gift to you. And so now, let's again, let's be clear. I'm not just talking about a day of the week. That would be more of an Old Testament understanding of Sabbath. In the New Testament, we, we find ourselves celebrating the Lord's Day, which is still a day of the week, Sunday, the day of resurrection, those kinds of things. But the whole idea, the theme of Sabbath rest moves from being an obligation day in the Old Testament. And in, in, our, in our holiest book, the New Testament, it becomes more of a statement of giftedness. It's a, it's, a, it's a daily reality. The Comforter, the Holy Spirit, exists in your life and goes with you everywhere you go. And no matter what you're facing, guess what? It can be restful. No matter where you're at, you can experience peace. No matter what you're facing, you can deal with that in a way that is acceptable and helpful and good and, and, and feels like a gift to you. New Testament Sabbath is, is a gift, not an obligation. And we want to make sure that we get that. You see, there are a lot of people in this world, maybe even some folks in this church, who have a hard time seeing God as the giver of gifts and not the bringer of obligations. Like, you know, like so many of us struggle with this, this, this law issue that sees God as the one who points his finger at you and tells you what you got to do right, right? And, and in the long run, if you don't watch out, you'll find yourself serving, following, living this weird, false gospel that says, God just wants me to do all the right stuff. And if I do everything correctly and follow through with all of my obligations appropriately, then God will bless me. The problem is that that fits the, the MO of a lot of world religions, just not Christianity. Christianity understands that any obligation I have to God is met in Christ, not met in me. That any obligation that I have toward holiness or righteousness to God is met in Christ, not met out of my behavior. In fact, the New Testament teaches us that my behavior, even my best behavior, is not good enough to meet obligations that God has. That's why Christ had to live. It's why Christ had to serve. It's why Christ had to heal. It's why Christ had to do so without sin. And it's why Christ had to die and rise again. Because in Christ, those obligations are met. And if I'm in Christ, Christ is in me, then, then I, I'm not living life out of obligation to God. My obligations have been met. What I'm, I'm living life out of gifting. A, a gift that he's given me and that he's given you that means that we get, an, we get to experience rest whenever we're willing to trust him. We get to experience peace 
whenever we're willing to follow him, to listen to him. Don't see Sabbath as an obligation. See Sabbath as a gift. And I'll prove it to you that not only is it a gift, but it's a good gift. Matthew 7, 7 through 11, Jesus is speaking again, and he says this, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. The one who knocks, uh, who knocks it will be opened. Uh, kind of a door metaphor there. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent. Now, there might be some dads in this room who would think that would be funny. Tyson, I could totally see your daughter going, hey, can I have a new pet? And you like hand her a snake. You know, I could see, I could see that, okay? I'm not talking about joking, goofing around. Like, this is, these are serious statements. Like, if your son really needs a fish, then a good dad's going to give him a fish. He's not going to give him a snake. He really needs bread. A good dad's not going to give him a rock. He's going to give him bread. That's what he needs. That's what the statement is. So if you then, who are, in other words, not holy, the word's translated evil, but it's not intended to have such a connotation of like, you know, like, 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 it's not supposed to come across like convict or guilty, just, just, just not holy. Okay. Just, we're not like God. Those of you who are not like God and you know how to give your gifts, good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask for him? In other words, when God gives a gift, it's a good gift. Okay. When God gives a gift, it's, it's a great gift. When, when God gives us the gift of Sabbath, he's giving us something that, that's helpful and brings wonderful opportunity to our, life, not our lives, not just something that brings obligation, okay? So don't be someone who has a hard time seeing God as a gift giver. Now, let me ask you this. In life, when you get a gift that maybe you didn't like that much, how many of you have ever re-gifted? Anybody? Ever re-gifted? If you're not raising your hand, it's because you're re-gifted to somebody in the room. Okay, I get it. Re-gifting, right? Re-gifting. Re- like like uh, uh, we go to a family thing every year. That we do. We used to call them white elephant. I don't. Now they call them dirty Santa. I think you like the trade around. Somebody brought. Uh, somebody brought like like in year one. Somebody brought a fruit cake. Okay. I don't know where you are on this. I'm not a fan. Not really a fruit cake kind of person. It's just not my favorite. Meal, that does not mean buy me all fruitcakes for Christmas, okay? Please. Um, somebody brought a fruitcake. It was wrapped up. And the next year, apparently they stuck it in the freezer. And the next year, they re-gifted the same fruitcake. And then that person took it home, stuck it in the freezer. And the next year, somebody brought back the same fruitcake again. And before you know it, we're eight or nine or ten years in, and the same fruitcake's being passed around to different people. Yeah, I know it. Like, that's uh, like, really? Yeah, that's our family. Um, so, so I, I get, I get, okay, that, that uh, we might re-gift. I want to use that word in a different term, like not in a bad gift, but how do you re-gift a good gift, okay? How do you re-gift something that you're so thankful you were given, and you want to make sure everybody else gets it too, okay? So re-gifting, uh, the Sabbath is an opportunity, and the rest given to you from God is an opportunity for you to give the gift of you to someone else, to give the gift of you to someone else. Now, don't raise your hand, but just think about this. How many of you wish there was more of you to go around? Like there was more time in the day, like more opportunity, more moments. Okay, you get on Facebook, and you see your friend, and they're like doing all these special awesome things with their kids, and you're thinking, I don't don't, don't remember the last time I got to do that. I, I, I just try to get their room clean and their clothes clean and them bathed and in bed before they, you know, before midnight. That's what I'm trying to accomplish and, and so you kind of feel a little bit like, man, there are all these special moments that we're missing, and there are all these situations that I don't, I'm going to look back, and I don't want to have regrets, and I don't want to wish there had been more, or, or maybe like the last time you went on a date, like say, when did you go on a date last? And you're thinking that time when you went to Walmart to get like cold cuts, because you forgot them the day before. Like, that's not a date, right? That doesn't, that doesn't get to count, okay? So, so how many of us have done that, and we find ourselves living life kind of just digging through to the next day, and in the long run, find ourselves missing some of the the really special moments that we thought life was going to be filled with. Here's my advice for the day, is that Sabbath is meant to be re-gifted. Here's what I mean by that. Sabbath is meant to be a gift that you receive, and then you give it away. So God gives you moments of rest, and my encouragement to you is that you give those moments of rest 
to others. Here's what I mean. What if you were to give some Sabbath to your family? Hey, guys, and this, again, it could be on Sunday. It doesn't have to be on Sunday. It could be whenever it is. But, hey, guys, this Thursday night, we're not, we're not cleaning our room. We're not doing laundry. We're not, you know, we're, we're going to get our homework done and finished and done with it. And then we're just going to watch a movie together. We're going we're gonna to cook what you guys want, and we're going to just cook it together and spend time together, and we're just going to do that. That's what we're going to do. Or, or what, what if you just really thought, you know, like you got one kid that just loves batting cages, and everybody else hates batting cages, but the one kid loves the batting cages, and so you get all the rest of the family together, and you're like, look, for an hour on Saturday, we all love batting cages. Put your smile on. Have a good time with your little brother. He loves batting cages, and it gets to be about him today, right? We're going to go do that with him. We're going to enjoy it. We're going to find like we're going to enjoy that. We're going to rest and we're going to slow down. We're going to turn off our phones. We're going to turn off whatever thing that anybody might use to interrupt that moment, and we're going to make it impossible. And we're just going to let this moment exist. Let it be. Let it happen. We're going to re-gift Sabbath. But God's given us a moment to rest, and we're going to do it with our family. That's a beautiful thing, and it should happen honestly pretty often. What about re-gifting Sabbath to your spouse, right? Where, where a date gets to be more than a burger in a cardboard packet, you know, and it doesn't involve a, a shopping cart, you know, or anything like that at all. You get to just spend time together. It doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be fancy, but it does need to be not about what you're doing, about the person you're doing it with. It's about them. So if that means, you know, if, if that means playing cards at home, then that's great. And if that means going for a drive in the country because it's beautiful with the windows down, that's great. In my case, if that means taking the top off the Jeep and going and finding a dirt road somewhere together, that's what we're going to do, you know? That's what I'm talking about. It's just, what if you re-gifted Sabbath? Daddy or mama is going to take a break. We're going to take four hours. We're not going to do anything about work. We're not going to do anything about responsibility. We're not going to do anything about obligation. And we're just going to enjoy each other for a moment. What about this? What if you re-gifted? We've talked about re-gifting Sabbath to your family or maybe to your spouse. What if you re-gifted it to a good friend? Like we all have people that you're like, man, back before I got married, we spent all kinds of time together. Back before I had kids, I used to play golf with him once a week, or I used to do this, but now you're thinking, I don't, I don't remember the last time I hung out with that person or spent any time with them, right? So how about re-gifting some Sabbath occasionally to rekindle a genuine, long-term, healthy, good friendship? Going and spending some time with somebody that means a lot to you, but you've had to kind of abandon a lot of that time because of life. See, don't make the mistake so many people have made and you just long-term abandon it and just let it go and just forget about it and move on. And we blame things like stages of life, like, well, I got married, I had kids, I got, we moved away. No, no, God may very well have given you a great friendship that needs to be fostered. And so give some Sabbath to that sometimes, like give some, a moment to that. What about this one? This was a little different. What about gifting Sabbath to a total and complete stranger? A moment of rest to a total and complete stranger. I, I'll give you an example from yesterday. Uh, this was not planned. Uh, yesterday was a fun day for us. Our oldest son was running in regionals. at a, He's on high school track team. And so that was in the afternoon. In the morning, uh, I got a chance to go with our youngest son to the Iron Mom Half Marathon in Paducah. Because I'm a runner. Everybody can tell just by looking at me that I run all the time. No. Uh, yeah, I used to. But anyway, I was there. We were serving bottles of water uh, and... And we're having a good time seeing people. Several people from this church, by the way. There were a few of them got to the mile marker, and they looked like they had not run. A couple of folks got to the mile marker, and they were like, <gasps> about to die. I thought it was great about in the top 30% was a dude in a wheelchair. I spent the next time telling everybody there's a guy in a wheelchair out running you. <laughs> there's a guy in a wheelchair passed here about two minutes ago. Come on now. Pick it up. Pick it up, right? So I'm having a good time enjoying this break. We've got music playing. We're giving away you know, glasses of water. And it came time for us to finish. We were done. And, and we had a couple of things to do, but nothing really all that focused. And I needed to show up in, in Murray to be at regional track tournament that afternoon. So Jackson and I are in the truck. We're driving through Paducah, playing Pokemon. You know, like we're just goofing off, okay? And we drove up to a stoplight, and there was a, a gentleman 
I'm going to say he's in his mid-60s, my guess. African-American fella. He's an amputee. One leg was removed, and he was on crutches. And no, no, um, no prosthetic leg or anything, just, just, uh, just a fellow with one leg on crutches. And he was standing there, and I honestly, had I been a normal Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday day, I would have been thinking about what I was about to go do. I would have had work on my mind. And I honestly, I wish this weren't true about myself, but I honestly think I probably would never have seen him. Like I would have not ever noticed that he was there. But this particular day, I was having Sabbath. I was resting. I didn't, my mind wasn't racing. I wasn't thinking about stuff. And we pulled up to a stoplight, and we sat there for a minute, and I noticed there's a man standing in a long coat. It's about 85 degrees outside. He's sweating profusely. He's on crutches. He's got one leg, and he's an older gentleman. And it just hit me. This is not a safe spot for him. Like, well, he's got nowhere to go, nowhere to sit down, nothing to do. And so I said, Jackson, we're going to see if we can help this fella. So we whipped over, got in the right lane. We got in the parking lot next to where he was standing. I got out. Jackson hopped out, got in the back seat of the truck to clear up the front seat. I went over to him and I said, sir, I know you don't know me, but if I can help you, I'd love to help you. And he said, can you take me to Hardy's? Okay. Now, now in this part of town, we were on probably like 14th street. There's a Hardy's in Paducah. I think it's on 21st street. We were maybe five, six blocks at the most from where it was. I said, sure, man, absolutely. So he climbed in my truck. I handed him his, his, helped him get in, handed him his crutches, closed the door. When I got in the truck, I had the air pumped up. It was blowing cold air in his face. He was happy about that. And I said, listen, man, I understand if you want to get a drink at Hardy's, but I'll take you anywhere. You want to go, you tell me where you want to go in Paducah and we'll do it. You know, like I'll help you out. And he said, no, I have to walk. I need to walk. I make myself walk every day. And I realized he was exercising. That's what he was doing. He was making himself do this. And he didn't want me to help him so much that I would take away the, his effort, you know, his, his involvement. He just, he just realized he had gotten five blocks from where he could sit down and he didn't have anything left right then. Now he was just, he was just tired. So we drove to Hardy's and I parked in the parking lot. I got out, helped him get out and he walked around, and he shook my hand, and he thanked me, and I noticed on his shirt that he was a veteran, and so I thanked him for that, and I, he, was, he was walking in, and I went, and I got back in my truck, and I was going to leave, and again, he turned around just in a, this little moment. He turned, and he looked at me and, and made eye contact, and again, if I had been rushing, if I had been thinking about what to do next, I'm telling you guys, I would have driven right off. I would have never seen that little, you know, that little indicator, you know, that he was so I, I, I didn't start the truck. I opened my door and I said, sir, can I help you some other way? And he motioned for me and I came over to him and he said, do you, do you have any money? I don't, I don't have any money. And I said, yeah. And so I gave him a, a little bit of cash and, and, and I said, is this enough? And he said, yeah. And I said, sir, we will sit right here until you're done eating and we'll take you home if that would help. And he said, no, I need to make myself walk home. I need to. I said, okay, okay. You know, that, that's good. And so shook his hand again, got in the truck, and we left. And what was really awesome was for the next 10 or 20 minutes, I got to talk to my 12-year-old son about the importance of helping somebody. You know what I mean? Like on another day, he might have been playing on his phone, and I might have been listening to the radio, and we might have completely missed what happened right there. But that's, in my opinion, a rare moment where I got a chance to share Sabbath. I took a break. My brain was in relaxed mode. I was noticing what was going on around me, and I got to help somebody. And God, I think, used it to help my son in the process. See, th this, is my, this is my advice. What if we could relax and rest our brain to the point where we notice what other people are experiencing? We notice what people are going through, and we don't pass right by it because we're doing life, you know? I think that's the way we could share we could share or re-gift Sabbath. And the last one I would mention is this. Today's Mother's Day. Uh, and on Mother's Day, we, we celebrate uh, the, the, the role that adults take in children's lives, and specifically uh, moms or, or females who invest in, in children's lives. But one of the ways that we as members of this church get a chance to share or re-gift our Sabbath is that every Sunday there are people who invest in the lives of infants and they sit in that nursery and they hold somebody else's baby and they rock somebody else's baby and they hug somebody else's baby and they sing to somebody else's baby 
And I got bragged on in the first gathering for not mentioning diapers, but the honest truth is they changed somebody else's baby's diaper, right? And in other classrooms, there are people who take part of their Sabbath and they give it to first and second graders or third and fourth graders. And they just show them love and teach them about God and play games with them and sing songs with them. And there are others who gather together with middle schoolers and high schoolers and let them talk about the things they face and let them experience together what it means to do friendship and to understand God's guidance and direction in their life. And, and they take some of their day off and they invest it in somebody else's kid, somebody else's teenager's life. There are those who take time to be involved in one of our adult Bible studies and things because they want to invest time in somebody else's life. And for them, here's what's crazy. It doesn't feel like a sacrifice, like, oh my gosh, I gave up part of my day off to do this good deed. It doesn't feel like that at all. It actually becomes something that you genuinely look forward to and realize makes your restful day more, um, you know, more of a celebration, more joyful. I share all this to say this, and I'm done for the day, is rest and Sabbath rest is a great gift given to you by a good God who only gives good gifts. And that good God gave you a good gift because he wants to give you peace. He wants to give you rest. But in the process, he's guiding and directing us to re-gift it, re-gift it, find ways to make sure that we don't waste our leisure on just the recliner, you know? We don't waste our leisure on just our favorite hobby. We don't waste our leisure on just the act of doing nothing. But in the midst of being able to rest our mind and rest our spirit and rest our body, then we get to re-gift that by investing in our families, investing in friendships, our marriages, investing in the lives of people who maybe we didn't even know yesterday and we may never see again, okay? We get the opportunity, without a doubt, to invest in people's lives. So today, thank God for the gift of rest and at the same time, open our eyes, say, God, help me see how I can re-gift that gift and invest it in someone else's life. Make my restful moments useful, helpful, and good. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we don't want to waste our rest. And at the same time, Lord, we don't want to make the mistake of turning rest into obligation. All too often in our culture, we turn your gifts into obligations. We turn rest into work. Father, I pray that you would help us today. Truth is this, Lord, and just for me to be as blatantly honest and blunt as I can be with you and with those who are listening to my voice, is that as a culture, we're busy and we're anxious. We're filled with so many things to do. And oftentimes, Lord, our motivation is positive. We're doing those things for good reasons, but I pray, Lord, that you would help us today to see what we might be missing when we don't rest, to see what we overlook relationally when we don't rest, and to see how we can invest in the lives of those who, who matter most to us, but more importantly, Lord, how we can be used to connect with those who are so valuable to you. I pray for families. I pray for marriages. I pray for parenting for children. I pray, Lord, for mothers and fathers, for husbands and wives. I pray, Lord, for strangers, those that we haven't even met yet, that you would give us the opportunity to matter. That in our moments of rest, that we would notice the needs around us, that Lord, I pray for the children, very young, and those becoming kind of their own personality, developing their own even grown-up, more mature way of thinking. We pray for our teenagers, Lord. Pray for those who need others. I pray, Lord, that you would raise up men and women who would re-gift their Sabbath and share some of that restful time with people who need them. Lord, help us to do this in a way that's 
that honors the good gift you've given us and that makes useful the time and the spirit that you've invested in us. We trust you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me? It may be that, I know that the opportunity for a response today is pretty broad, it's pretty wide. It may be that right where you're at, you're standing near a mom who's been a mother to you, a mother to your children, a mother to others in your life, and you might just honestly just need to give her a big hug and just thank her for what she's done. That could be a beautiful response, okay? It might be that you're here today and you, like we talked about earlier, struggling with the loss of a mom, the distance maybe that you might feel, and this would be a great opportunity for you to take that to the Lord and just ask for his peace, his rest in that relationship. It might be that that's a kind of a powerful enough emotion in you right now that you need to grab someone who you can trust that's near you and just say, would you pray with me about that? Would you, would you pray with me? Would you ask God to give me peace about this? It may be that you're here and completely unrelated to the holiday, you're dealing with something that needs the rest of God, the peace of God. And you could just reach out to him and say, God, please help me experience the peace that goes beyond or passes all understanding so that today, Lord, I can feel, sense, know, and live out your presence. It may be that you're dealing with a sin that you need to confess to the Lord and, and let him deal with so that you can move on without it. Whatever it is that you may be facing, let's respond to him, let's worship him, and let's deal with it right now so that he can implant in us beautiful rest. Jesus, we trust you and we worship you. Amen. Before the throne of God I have a strong seated for a second. Thank you all so much for being here today. I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. It's going to be a little warm, but it's going to be beautiful and sunny outside, so take every advantage of this. Uh, think about think about who you could bless with a phone call today, okay? The truth is, there probably have been, there are the obvious ones, right? You need to call your mom, okay? That's the obvious ones. You need to do that if you don't get a chance to see her face to face. Obviously, there'll be some visiting uh, in, a, in a more sad note, there'll be some visiting uh, places of burial today, you know, just to think about or be thankful for the mom God gave them in life. But there might be others, there might be others who've been a great influence to you that would be blown away by a phone call for you, from you. Uh, and if you can think of someone that you could be a great blessing today too, uh, just by reaching out to say thank you to them for the nurturing investment that they made in your life, I would just greatly encourage you to do that, okay? Okay. Um, couple of things you need to know. One, keep in mind that every Monday night here at 6.30, we sponsor Celebrate Recovery, which I'm so excited about. I wish that we had talked about it to you more than we have, but Celebrate Recovery is a worship gathering 
uh, that involves also kind of a 12-step program that helps people move beyond and move through uh, life-controlling issues. It's not all about drug addiction or alcoholism. There are things beyond that. Uh, eventually, through CR, we will offer divorce recovery and, and things dealing with health issues. And really, anybody who's dealing with a hang-up or some sort of issue that's causing struggle in their spiritual life, it's a fantastic ministry, and I, I'm really pumped about it. I think we've got about 30 people coming now, and uh, you are invited. Like We'd love for you to, even if you just show up one Monday night to experience it, I encourage you to do so. Dress code is very relaxed and casual. They have great music, great teaching, and uh, testimony time. So it's, it's a good event I encourage you to come to. Uh, also, a couple of things you need to be aware of. If you still have anything uh, out related to the mission trip this summer, uh, the, the, the time is coming when we need to close the door on all the paperwork and, and money being paid and all those things. So, so if you could kind of get that finalized, that would be very wise and good. Um, I want you to make sure you know about that. Leadership team members will be meeting next Sunday after church for leadership meetings, so I hope you're available for that. Your handout may have other information. I'm sure there are other things that you need to be aware of. Uh, school lets out soon. We're getting ready to kick off the summer, uh, and when you need to know this, and we'll be done, Wednesday nights, uh, we give our teachers and leaders a break through the summer, and we take Wednesday nights off. So uh, after school is out, there'll be no more Wednesday nights until school starts back. Uh, so just know that. That goes for the adult class all the way down to the youngest kids. So I, I think that, that might mean that this Wednesday is our final. Yeah, this Wednesday is our final Wednesday. Now, for those in the edge class, which is fifth and sixth grade, and for those in youth group, which would be seventh grade and up, we are going to be doing what I think is kind of described as a yard party, like a, like a block party celebration on Wednesday nights through the summer. Josh, do you want to, I didn't warn you, but do you want to tell us about that? That's great. And that's at your house, right? Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Everybody, thank you so much for being here today. Have a great afternoon. We'll see you next week.